World War I ushered in an increased demand for coal. Coal production rose from 111 million tons in 1890 to 579 million tons by 1918. During the war, the total number of employed miners rose from 561,000 to 615,000. However, this growth was not to last. The demand for coal at the end of the war dropped nearly 60%, with the loss of munitions markets in Europe. Competition from alternate fuel sources and the improved utilization of coal due to new technologies further harmed the industry. This was in stark contrast to the norm during the Roaring Twenties, with the majority of industries experiencing growth. Burdened with massive surpluses, the coal companies began to cut wages, further aggravating tensions between the miners and the operators. The many labor uprisings of the early 1900s and the Battle of Blair Mountain, which was the largest of its kind, served to reform the way the government viewed unions' rights. The operator-miner dispute originated from a feudalistic system of brutality and exploitation. One of the most important parts of this system was the payment of miners in scrip, a monetary system only accepted at the company-owned store, another type of script called Esau, for the wives of miners. If her husband was injured and couldn't work or in debt, she could borrow Esau. If, however, she was unable to pay it back, she was forced into sexual servitude. The operator's tactics were not limited to these two forms of scrip. The owners also used their own private security force to prevent unionization, planted spies to root out union miners, and even constructed their own company courthouses. Everything the operators did, right down to the design of the company store, was meant to keep the miners in check. The arrogant and insolent gentlemen do not hesitate to suborn public officials in their communities, to police their communities with privately hired and armed gunmen, to evict our people from their homes, to cut off food supplies for our people and leave them to their mercy, to cut off water and electric light, and to cut off medical attention. And apparently, we have plenty of aid to give stricken peoples anywhere in the world except in the mining regions of this country. May 19, 1920, 13 Baldwin Feltz detectives arrived in the town of Maitland in Mingo County along the Kentucky-West Virginia border. The Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency regularly supplied the mine operators with men who served as mine guards, rapists, and all-around hired thugs, much like their Pinkerton doubles to the north. These particular agents were here to serve eviction notices. They set to work clearing the miners' cabins, hauling out their furniture, and piling it in the streets. The miners and their families were powerless to stop them. After illegally evicting the miners, the agents returned to town, where Sid Hatfield, the chief of police, and the mayor of Mountain, Cable Testament, confronted the agents. Sid Hatfield told them they were under arrest. Albert Feltz, the leader of the eviction gang, countered with a claim that he had a warrant for Sid's arrest. Testament asked to see the warrant, and after studying it, he declared, it's bogus. Albert Feltz said nothing, but continued to smile as he drew his pistol. Accounts vary at this point, and it is unclear who fired first. Some claim Sid Hatfield shot both Albert and the mayor from the porch of the hardware store. Others claim that Feltz shot the mayor and Sid shot him. However, everyone agreed that Mayor Testerman and Albert Feltz were the first to fall. In the chaos that ensued, ten people were killed, and four wounded. Out of the dead, seven were Baldwin Feltz agents, and three, including the mayor, were citizens of Matwin. The trial of the massacre was closely followed by many West Virginia newspapers, and in the months following, Sid Hatfield became the embodiment of the Union struggle. In July of 1921, Sid Hatfield was charged with blowing up a coal tipple in Mohawk. His court appearance was set for the 1st of August in McDowell County. McDowell was a coal company stronghold, and Hatfield made his misgivings about going perfectly clear. On his behalf, the union leaders of District 17, Ed Mooney and Frank Keeney, dictated a letter to County Judge Strother, who was set to preside over Hatfield's trial, outlining Hatfield's fears. Awaiting his arrival at the McDowell County Courthouse were three Baldwin Feltz agents. Charles E. Lively, a Baldwin Feltz spy, Bill Saltier, a survivor of the Mountain Massacre, and George Pence, whose motto was, shoot him with one gun and hand him another. When Hatfield reached the top of the steps, the three men opened fire, killing Hatfield. The next day, over 2,000 people turned out for Sid's funeral, and 2,000 Union men from Huntington put down their tools for an hour out of respect. Miners were angry, and some began to arm themselves. Specifically, after choice statements by the Sheriff of McDowell, collaborating the agent's claim of self-defense, Kinney and Mooney counseled the miners to be patient and delivered a petition to Governor Morgan. However, miners continued to rise up, 
some at the behest of Mother Jones, a famed labor orator who delivered an aggressive speech in front of the Union headquarters. Mother Jones helped lead many strikes, including what became known as the Ludlow Massacre in 1914. Soon groups of armed miners began to patrol the roads. Logan County Sheriff Don Chaffin, a staunch supporter of the operators, soon grew nervous and called for the state guard. On August 12th, tensions mounted after one trooper accidentally rode his horse into a parked car. The troopers, no doubt feeling foolish, viciously attacked the owner. A group of armed miners then shot up a car they mistook for a police vehicle when they attempted to take their revenge. When an actual state police car arrived, the miners pulled the officers from their car, took away their weapons, and chased them home. The next week, on August 17th, Governor Morgan flatly rejected the petition, and that in addition to rumors claiming that Chaffin and Feltz agents were accosting Union miners and their families in Logan County was enough to start the battle. Soon enough, miners were on the march. Estimates placed their numbers at anywhere from 4,000 to 9,000 and beyond. In response, Sheriff Chaffin mustered up a defending force of about 900 to 1,200. Miners hijacked trains, raided stores for arms and munitions, and by August 29th, the battle was in full swing. Although outnumbered, Chaffin's army had the higher ground and better weaponry, including planes armed with homemade bombs and several machine guns. The miners and the defenders engaged in sporadic fighting for four days, and at one point the miners almost broke through to the town of Logan. Most of the fighting occurred in four locations, Beach Creek, Blair Mountain, Crooked Creek, and Mill Creek. Governor Morgan became increasingly desperate in his pleas for federal support. However, it wasn't until September 2nd that his pleas were answered. Upon the arrival of federal troops, miners were enthusiastic, assuming the troops would support them. However, the troops did not take sides, and in lieu of fighting the military, which many miners were unwilling to do, miners laid down their arms and retired from the field of battle. Casualty figures have no clear number, with estimates between 60 and 130 dead, most of which were miners. 985 miners were later convicted of murder, conspiracy to commit murder, or accessory to murder. The battle resulted in a massive drop in UMWA membership. In West Virginia alone, membership dropped from 50,000 to a couple hundred. Nationally, membership dropped from 600,000 to 100,000 by the end of the decade. After the battle, miners were forced to sign contracts for tonnage rates far below the pre-war levels. In part due to the public backlash caused by the company's portrayal of the unions and their members as communists. In the long run, the battle was a victory for the Union because it resulted in an increased awareness for the plight of miners and their unions. The Battle of Blair Mountain and the events surrounding it led to the first ever Senate hearings into the conditions laborers were subjected to, and it helped teach the government that it had the authority to regulate and investigate working conditions. Under the Roosevelt administration, the government first addressed these issues with the passing of many bills as part of the New Deal in order to combat the Great Depression. The first major bill to address these issues was the National Industrial Recovery Act or NERA, in 1933. It gave unions collective bargaining rights and permitted the regulation of working conditions by the government. NERA was ineffective as it gave major companies control over regulation within their respective industries. The 7A clause, which established the right of workers to unionize, was misconstrued to allow companies to create unions which fit the requirement. Soon enough, during Shedder v. United States in 1935, it was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. However, Senator Robert Wagner managed to pass the successor to NERA later that same year. The new bill was known as the National Labor Relations Act, more informally known as the Wagner Act. The Wagner Act did three things. It outlawed unfair labor practices of employers, including firing workers for union activity. It allowed employees to choose representatives, and it established the National Labor Relations Board, which enforced the act. When the Wagner Act went before the Supreme Court in 1937, it was declared constitutionally valid. Much of the reformation outlined in these bills was inspired by a series of hearings that had started earlier that year and would extend into 1940. This series of hearings was the largest investigation into working conditions and workers' rights to date, spearheaded by Robert M. Lafoyette Jr., a progressive Republican from Wisconsin. This revolution of miners caused a reaction in the government, and the reforms that followed it have echoed throughout the rest of the century, and to this day, the Battle of Blair Mountain remains the largest civil insurrection in the United States since the Civil War. People say a man is made out of mud, a poor man's made out of muscle and blood, muscle and blood and skin and bones, a mind that's weak and a back that's strong, you load the 16 ton, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt, St. Peter don't you call me cause I can't go, I owe my soul to the company store.